Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. We, I actually, um, doing this intro, I was like, do I change how I say the second part after? So you say, hey, everybody. And then I say, welcome. I don't know if I, like, sometimes I say, welcome back to another episode of, or I don't even know. Now yeah, I'm lost. Yeah, you, like, you did change it a couple episodes ago. You were like, thanks for coming back to another. It was very strange. I was very confused while editing. Yeah, it happens. I think my brain just has like a, doesn't know what we're doing. Well, uh, well I, I mean, the brain never knows what we're doing. That's true. It's true. Only the heart does. And absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're not absent this week. <laughs> no. So, so Zach, what have uh, what have you been playing uh, recently? Well, Seth, I've recently been playing Phasmophobia, and I've been playing it with you on the internet. I have been there on the internet with you while we played Phasmophobia. It's a funny yeah. name to say. Phasmophobia was released in September of 2020 by Kinetic Games. It is a four-player online co-op psychological horror game. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's just a little. Just like the name. Yes, exactly. So in, in Phasmophobia, you play as a, a paranormal investigator or, or a couple of paranormal investigators as, as paranormal activity is on the rise. And it's up to you and your team to use all your ghost hunting equipment at your disposal in order to gather as much evidence as you can. And I do want to clarify, you are not ghost busting. There's Correct. no busting of the ghosts going on here. You are clearly, you are, you are only going into buildings and finding ghosts. Yeah. And then leaving those buildings yeah. as quickly as you can. Yeah, you're just ghost finding. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like the ghost identification game. But it's, it's very cool. I like a lot of the elements it uses, such as tapping into your microphone to make the ghost scarier uh, because they'll hear you say certain words and they'll get mad. And I think that's a clever, clever technique. It's fun. I think it's an interesting uh, game. We were... Uh able to uh, play it with our friend who's on Twitch at Tyler Nerdum and he was much more experienced than we were. Yes, he was. He was so experienced that one of my friends who was watching our stream thought he was an AI in the game. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So there you go, uh, Michael. We enjoyed having you with us on the time that we played the game and we will hopefully play some more. Yeah, that's a, it's a fun. Yeah, the, definitely. I like the how it, if you say certain words, the ghost acts up. I I did enjoy when I was going through the tutorial. I had the mic bound to the wrong mic. Yes. So it wasn't actually picking me up. So my ghost was very friendly because yeah. he couldn't hear me. Whereas my ghost in the tutorial was very mad at me because he could hear me and he he did not like me. Well, so I have been playing. Uh, Solasta, Crown of the Magister, which... That's also a mouthful. <laughs> it is a mouthful. Uh, is developed by Tactical Adventures and also self-published by them through Kickstarter. It entered early access on Steam, available to purchase on October 20th. It is a game that is licensed D&D, but licensed SRD 5.1 rule set, which is may be confusing if you are unaware of how things work in the D&D world. Uh, when a game is licensed uh, SRD, it essentially, which is a system reference document, is what SRD stands for. Uh, when it is a licensed SRD, they're allowed to publish commercial products using the rules that are published in that system reference document, which may not be the complete rules or available monsters but it's a cheaper license to obtain so if you feel like you can do everything that you want to do with what the srd has then you can pay a cheaper license to not license all of DD, but just license that rule set so it is a dungeons and dragons game but it's set in its own world called celestia and i part of it so it's an interesting take on D&D. So, now, mind you, we also have Baldur's Gate 3 that's also out there, which is officially licensed by Dungeons & Dragons and officially, like, fully licensed by Dungeons & Dragons, where this is 
not officially fully licensed so there there is differences in regards to how deep both of the games can go but this celastia game has a really cool character generation and i'm not going to compare this to baldur's gate 3 i think that they are uh two different type of role-playing games and i actually think that celastia is a little more like classic role-playing game and you build out your four custom characters in your party and i think it's interesting because it goes through this character generation kind of like you're almost building a DD character there's different aspects that you have to choose from so you you may build a rogue and then you're gonna have to pick a background like you do in fifth edition D D. and that background could be like an aristocrat or you could be a low life and based on your alignment and based on your background you'll get traits of personality traits where you may be cynical or you may be kind or forgiving or something like that okay and you pick two traits from each of your like from your background and from your alignment and you mix them together to get this personality and also your background may say whether or not your character speaks formally or casually and in the cutscenes, your character will act the way that your personality traits drive them. So like I have an elf who's a, an aristocrat who speaks when she speaks she speaks very formally. She's also like a scholar, so she's like very well read and very like or well she's actually an aristocrat not a scholar, but so she's very like hoity toity. And then I have a dwarven cleric who is more of like he's like an alkalite, so he's more like uh, reserved and pragmatic when he speaks. And then like the cutscene will then also give you options to when somebody asks you a question you can answer the question from any of the four characters and so it kind of had it just is kind of cool where you can kind of uh see how the, and they're all all voice acted and all of that and it, it's it's very cool how it kind of drives the game that way i've only played a couple hours of it so i i don't have like a full take on it and it isn't early accessed i apparently wishlist it like years ago like like 20 well maybe not years ago well before we started doing the podcast for sure and i think maybe i I saw it at PAX, but I it came out um, recently and I picked it up and I'm really happy I picked it up. It plays similar-ish to um, like a Divinity game or the Baldur's Gate 3 game, except okay. it has like a, a grid when you go into combat and but it plays with the D&D 5th edition rules. So you have like you have an action, you have a bonus action, you have a move action, um, very similar to how it works. The action economy, as it were, in Dungeons and Dragons, where you can move attack and use a bonus action. So it's, it's really cool. I, I enjoy it. I'm excited to uh, get back into it as well. Today we are talking about something that has nothing to do with either of our recently plays, though kind of, I guess, has to do with the first because we are sticking with the theme of horror. Um, and today we are talking about arcade horror games, which is kind of a unique topic because you don't really think of horror and like arcade games in the same sentence. But there are plenty of horror themed arcade games. Yeah. And and I like I like uh, we do. We've done these arcade cabinet type segments before. Like we talk. We have other episodes dedicated to arcades. We've talked about beat em up games. And we've talked about uh, rail shooters. So if you are interested in this Gun like Blade arcade York. cabinets, <laughs> like where we talk about Gunblade New York, uh, check out some earlier episodes. And we we also are pro- we're going to produce more. Um, we're gonna we're gonna come back. There's a lot of of wood to chop, as it were, on arcade cabinets. So yeah, there is. We'll uh we'll we're this is gonna be a a, a topic that we will repeat as it's kind of its own little arcade series, but. So, Zach, do you have memories of playing arcade horror games? Yeah, so not a lot of them because most of the arcade... I mean, I was growing up in a time when arcades were kind of a uncommon sight. Um, there was only two arcades in the town that I spent most of my time growing up in, which was here in Massachusetts. Uh, one arcade was called Fun and Games, um, which had zero horror themed games um and the other arcade was just the arcade that was located in the movie theater um which had a house of the dead 
machine um specifically house of the dead 2 um and that was the only horror arcade game that i've really played and i actually even though it's a very dated game i did find it spooky i was a little when i was first playing that game i was in middle school and i was a little nervous around horror in in general i hadn't started watching horror movies or or really played a lot of horror games so even house of the dead which was at that time an older game and had very bad graphics was still kind of spooky for me to play but um yeah i also didn't have a lot of arcades um present i did go to an arcade called shooters which was more of a it was a billiard and an arcade hall as it were and there was also um i've also been to dave and busters more than once and i actually think that i've been to more arcades as a grown-up than a child yeah because it's in vogue to have like a barcade now and through my adulthood i've played most of the house of the deads as well especially i really like any time that i can like play an arcade game with a ridiculous armature or some device that likes like gunblade new york with a giant machine gun or something like that oh yeah i don't care how many dollars it is i will sink like four or five dollars to play with something ridiculous though i do remember uh carnival which was a a horror game where you are you're at a a a very evil carnival and there are like zombies and it plays very similar to to like your shooters on rails as it were kind of like you know your virtual cops or what have you where you have your gun and you're reloading off screen and shooting these zombie creatures and you're trying not to shoot the civilians at the carnival you're just trying to shoot the monsters at the carnival so carnival both uh we so we talked more about house of the dead in our rail shooter episode because that's it is a it is a shooter on rails though carnival we don't talk about but and we're not going to talk about more in this episode so that's, oh, well. just, a, that's just a memory <laughs> however we we're going to talk about some horror themed games uh so the first game that we're going to be talking about is a game that was uh released in 1985 and was developed and published by capcom um, though it was published by Capcom in the world with worldwide release, but in North America, it was published by T- Taito America. Um, and that game is Ghosts in Goblins. Also is known as Ghouls and Goblins in later releases. Um, it was a side-scrolling platform arcade game that really spawned this franchise of games um that were ported to many different systems and actually so ghosts and goblins is a localization of the original japanese game and so the original japanese game is makimura which is literally translated to demon world village which which i wish we got that name which as which but they didn't really change much of the the game so you're still going into this demon world village versus like so there's that i feel like ghosts and goblins is probably a little more family friendly um than demon <laughs> world village oh yeah, uh, yeah especially well. in the 80s uh, when D D was bad <laughs> D was bad because the devil played it <laughs> yeah so putting out an arcade game that said demon world village is probably not the the best marketing strategy which is why it's ghost and goblins which sounds cutesy so the uh, the original arcade game did support one or two players though this game and a few other games that we'll talk about had like sequential player multiplayer it wasn't concurrent multiplayer so you wouldn't play the game at the same time uh you would essentially play the game and then you you would die and somebody else would play the game Uh, and the game would i think it was based on death you would it would turn off the player and go to the next player so on the on the cabinet itself each player had a jump and a fire button but there was like one on the left side and one on the right side and in the middle there was a single joystick for moving the character because you only played one character at one time so i don't i just don't understand like why why didn't they just do two buttons and a joystick i mean i guess if you could sit left by left and right so that you can just uh change off the joystick i guess that is the reason instead of like moving out of the way it's the artwork on the cabinet itself is classic 80s specifically the there's two ghosts on the cabinet and this game came out in 1985 and a movie that came out in 1984 that had ghosts in it called ghostbusters and 
the ghosts look extremely similar to Slimer from the 1984 Ghostbusters. Uh, There's also this like pretty ugly looking goblin on it and some manner of like a sword wheeling gorilla with a horn. After uh, going through some game footage, I realize that it's a Cyclops. It just looks like a gorilla on the box art because the one eye is not clear based on the angle of the drawing but it is a cyclops with a horn on the side panels is this is the same general artwork that is on the front and the header and then the side panels have the main character is included in the artwork where the where the on the front and the header there he's not there um and the main character is a, a knight who's in full plate full plate armor the whole game revolves around you controlling uh, Sir Arthur, who's the knight, and he's on his quest to save Princess Prin Prin from Astaroth, who Astaroth just happens to be the king of all demons. The enemies are all very monstrous in theming, such as zombies, ogres, demons, cyclops, dragons, and even some ghosts and some goblins. <laughs> it was notoriously difficult, and in the game, it worked on a mechanic where if you got hit once by the enemy, uh, your armor would just fly off of you and you would carry on playing while Arthur was in his underwear. And then the next time you got hit with an enemy, you died. And you essentially like crumpled into like a skeleton and were gone. So it was very difficult because if you got hit twice, you died. And then uh, player two would start. (laughs) The game also didn't allow you to beat the game on the first playthrough you had to beat the game twice in order to get to the actual real final boss who is guarding princess prin prin so even if you beat the game the first time you don't rescue it's like kind of like mario with your princess is another castle but it that castle was the entirety of the game that you just played on hard mode game's so nice you have to beat it twice it, it is and and you have to beat it at a more difficult setting and the enemies and the level layouts were tough because the enemies were tough because they also spawned randomly and wherever in the map and the levels were tough because they had diff- they had difficult layouts to navigate and it is actually considered one of the most difficult games ever the game spawned numerous sequels and ports uh arthur also appears in uh other capcom games such as marvel versus capcom and you can play as him as a fighter uh, the arcade cabinet sold very, very well. And there is an article in the Japanese magazine uh, Game Machine that uh, came out in the year that it was released back in uh, 1985. And it stated that Ghost and Goblins was the second most successful arcade unit of that year. So yeah, so that's uh, Ghost and Goblins. Uh, a fun a fun game that um it's very hard that is exceptionally hard and is 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 horror because you fight monsters including you you fight both ghosts and and goblins goblins well the next game is uh haunted castle which came out in 1988 it is a side-scrolling platform game from konami haunted castle is actually an adaptation of the original castlevania for the NES. Rather than a port though, Haunted Castle is actually an entirely new game running on new hardware. Um, so the game actually uses like 16-bit looking graphics. Uh, it was very impressive for the time. In the game, you play as Simon Belmont, who's on a quest to save his wife from Count Dracula. And to do so, you have to fight off monsters by killing them and <laughs> then getting to Dracula and killing him. Uh, in 1988, Haunted Castle was ranked the sixth most successful arcade cabinet in Game Machine magazine. Uh, The cabinet was kind of a standard arcade cabinet fitted with a CRT monitor, one joystick, and buttons for input. And just because it was actually a kit, there there weren't any dedicated systems. It was sold as a kit. The artwork featured was uh, like a gothic setting showing a silhouette of a castle. And on the side, there was this like sticker that people could put on, which had the same artwork with the castle. But it also just kind of had a skeleton on there. It was just kind of hanging out. Wasn't really doing anything really threatening. What is fun, though, is there's a there's an ad for the kit um where it says haunted castle re hyphen vamp an old game with this new kit 
And it shows this like kind of generic looking 80s woman hanging out in a cemetery as like the Bella Lugosi Dracula is behind her just making a weird face. Um, not, and then it has like like four screenshots of the game that are very, very small. <laughs> so <laughs> they were like, <laughs> focus on this. <laughs> But, I think uh, it's. I think that's a that's a like a classic vampire pun that companies use to release new vampire content. Oh yes, it's a revamp this classic. Oh, game. <laughs> revamp this classic. But yeah, a haunted castle, fun game. Uh, Castlevania is a fun game. So another common kit. So we we talk about kits, and essentially what the kit was was if you were an arcade owner and owned an arcade play game, like if you owned a, a physical building that had arcades you would have multiple machines and you'd have multiple cabinets some of these cabinets would produce a lot of money for you and some of them won't so uh, yeah you're wasting electricity if you constantly run a machine that doesn't produce money and will in fact lose money for the operation it, it may be quarters or even smaller denominations depending on the year that you're talking about but overall, like it's still consuming electricity. So if it makes zero dollars, that's a net loss. So in order to be able to get more, to, in order to save shipping costs from the game producer, and in order for the arcade owners to be able to revitalize older cabinets, many game companies sold conversion kits. And these kits were shipped out. You would buy the PCB board, which is the board that had the game and the inputs. You would put them in, you would connect your inputs and the game would boot up the, the new game. And you would generally get a new header and a new artwork that you could put onto the, the cabinet and scrape off the old artwork and put the new one on. And you could re essentially revitalize some older games that were less popular at the time. Uh, so Splatterhouse is another game that uh, was sold sh mostly as a, a kit versus a dedicated cabinet. Um, it is a, a beat-em-up arcade game that was developed by Namco. Uh, it was initially released in 1988 for the arcade um, worldwide in the 1989 in America. It was brought to other systems pretty quickly, such as the Turbo Graphics, uh, FM Towns, and the PC. And it's a love story about a guy who puts on a scary mask and turns himself into a one-man killing machine, all to save his girlfriend. The mask looks like a hockey mask, such as from the Friday the 13th series, and he is kind of, like, bulking as a character, and kind of does kind of have that uh, Jason Voorhees type of look. He Well, he also wears, like, a boiler suit, which is very similar to what Michael Myers wears in Halloween, so he's kind of an amalgamation of the two in his appearance. However, the mask is supposed to represent an Aztec sacrificial mask called the Hell Mask. And it definitely wasn't trying to capitalize on the success of the Friday the 13th series. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, the game consists of mostly moving left to right as you do in beat em up games. And you s hit monsters with various weapons such as your fists uh, or your mitts as uh, the guy from Sin City says. Uh, <laughs> the, a two by four, uh, a meat cleaver, a double barreled shotgun. And the game was also multiplayer, um, but it was that sequential multiplayer. So one person played and then the second person played. It, the controller would have two action buttons, a joystick, and then the one or two player mode button it was very very violent as uh when you would fight enemies with the cleaver it would like take off most of their top half and green blood would just gush out of the creature that you were fighting yeah it's, um, a, it's you, a pleasant sight it is very pleasant if you hit them with the two by four they go slamming up against the wall and the all that um gratuitous amounts of uh gore would come out the header that was given to the as the conversion kit w was just a house and it had bloody letters saying splatter house on it um and that was pretty much what was given to um people who were converting games to bring in splatterhouse and you can imagine some of these games maybe uh were seasonal too yeah so uh you would get like splatterhouse and maybe splatterhouse did really well in you know the lead into o halloween so your september and your october crowd and then after october maybe people wanted to play not 
a gory Halloween game. And so you convert it out. Yeah, um, into like Mortal Kombat or something. It's a Mortal Kombat. <laughs> just just right. a gl- gory game without the Halloween theme. <laughs> and a spoiler on uh, Splatterhouse, which being released in 1988, I, I feel like it's safe to spoil it. The Your girlfriend that you're trying to rescue is you have to kill her too. <laughs> yeah, she, she turns into a big scary monster. <laughs> There's just a lot of murder in that game. I mean, it lives up to its name, right? It's called Splatterhouse. So there's there's the kick right there. There's actually, there's also a Sega Genesis port of the, or a Sega Genesis sequel, Splatterhouse 2, um, which is very, very uncommon. Very hard cartridge to find. I do not own it. It's definitely a future. It, like it came out, yeah, it came out in Genesis? Yes. Yeah, it was very, very short-lived. Uh, I think it was like a late release. So it's not very, it's not very easy to find. Nice. We'll have to, we'll have to track it down. We will. So the next game, Night Slashers, was a 1993 beat-em-up by Data East. And now Night Slashers is a game that plays very similar to other games like Streets of Rage and uh, Final Fight, other beat-em-ups of this time period. The difference is there are spooky monsters in this game. (laughs) So you have up to three characters, they move left to right, while you fight through hordes of monsters. Uh, Some of the bosses include a mummy, there's Go- there's a golem elementals count dracula's there the grim reaper's there and frankenstein's monster to top it all off um the fun fact is the japanese version is like significantly different than the english version the the japanese version has a lot more blood and gore like actual red blood and gore while the english version w- in the american version was turned it was turned green very similar to the splatter house in the japanese version so when you're playing in these beat-em-up games and you're you're fighting all these bad guys the screen will lock for a period of time you can't continue forward until you kill all the bad guys on the screen the way the game indicates that you can move on is in most of these beat-em-ups it flashes the word go at the top of the screen with like an arrow in the japanese version it said to hell (laughs) so the game actually did fairly well in japan it ranked at number nine in the in the list of uh, most popular cabinets in 1993 from game machine so uh you know not not a small small game for sure it's also similar in the sense to other beat-em-ups in terms of how the cabinet was structured um so it was sold primarily as a kit and the the cabinet had uh there's an I believe a single player kit, but the pictures I saw at least were of a two player version, and a three player version uh, for multiple players. Uh, the artwork itself features the the main characters and they're kind of bathed in a silhouette. They have glowing eyes and it has the title Night Slashers right in the center. Good, good. Night Slasher sounds like uh, it would be a, f- a fun game that should team up with uh, the guy who's in Night Slashers to team up with the, g- with the guy in Splatterhouse. Yes. And they should, they should go on a, a gory rampage. So the... There is a game that is, was released uh, more recently uh, called Left for Dead Survivors, which is very similar to the game Left for Dead uh, <laughs> very for similar. the PC. It's a Japanese exclusive arcade cabinet because as much as there is a revitalization of arcade cabinets in America where you have like a barcade type situation becoming popular, I, I feel like they never fell out of fashion in Japan to where they still make just exclusive Japanese versions of games and never as in arcades and never oh, yeah. bring them to America yeah. because of the popularity of arcades over in that. It's just a cultural thing for them. So this Left 4 Dead, Left 4 Dead Survivors is an exclusive version of the left for dead 2 game that was released in april of 2014 for arcades uh it was developed by uh valve uh taito and nilio incorporated and it was distributed by taito games it has a whole new set of survivors uh, and audio lines that are in japanese so the characters were redesigned to the so the characters were redesigned and there's new set of survivors in order to appeal to the japanese market so they would it's a trend that would happen with arcade adaptions such as when they adapted silent hill or half-life 2 survivor so in order to appeal to the market in japan they would redesign to localize essentially the arcade game yeah 
um the the char- the, the survivors in left for dead survivors look actually kind of anime like that's kind of the design they are going for right which would make it so that they were appealing to the market that is yeah. going to consume this game. The campaigns are in the Left 4 Dead Survivors are significantly shorter than like your PC game. And the game also features updated uh, user interfaces and Japanese uh, text for the game. And it's interesting that essentially the, the company is double dipping in an existing franchise, right? So they have an yeah. existing game, they shorten it, localize it, and sell it as a cabinet and they'll make they and they may even lease these things out depending oh, yeah. on the situation the cabinet itself uh for left for dead survivors is an upright cabinet that features artwork for the game and the original logo it has green neon lights on the side that flank the flat screen television though the controls are a standard mouse and controller similar to the Wii nunchuck attachment. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So you're in the arcade using a mouse and Wii nunchuck. You're essentially using a stand-up computer that can only play one game. And and by standard mouse, um, I want to make it known here. I looked at a photo of this cabinet and it looks almost identical to my like my like Razer Death Adder mouse. I'm pretty sure it might be a rebranded Death Adder, (laughs) like just with the Razer logo covered up. (laughs) Uh, A fun feature that you can only do in the, the future of arcades is you can also do online play where you can play with other people playing the game at other arcades in japan since it's only in japan (laughs) yes yeah so that's it's kind of cool it almost um it it continues to breed that culture right so you can go to the arcade you can actually match with somebody over and over again who is also going to the arcade to just play with you and they could be on the other side of japan and you can develop a friendship through this this game i don't i i'm sure there's i don't know how extensive of a friendship you can make but yeah well another cool thing is that um something i forgot to put in the notes was just that um the games that taito ended up porting over to uh, arcades such as uh left for dead survivor half-life 2 survivor and they actually did a counter-strike game called counter-strike neo had a save functionality which you don't really see in arcade games and the way it worked was you could get this card that would save your user data so that when you went back to the arcade you tap your card and it would load all your user data up you had to pay for the card obviously um you know you had to you had to have like a membership sort of thing to to use the card but that's just kind of a cool feature you didn't have to sit through a whole set a sitting of like half-life 2 uh, <laughs> you know in the arcade um you could come back and, and play it if you if you want to play more of it that's yeah that's pretty cool uh, so the last cabinet we're going to talk about is kind of a weird one. Um, to be honest, I mostly included this because I, I don't have any idea of where else we would put this one <laughs> besides maybe in a future episode on, on the game. But um, Seth, did you know that there was a Quake arcade cabinet? I did not. I No, I, I did not know that they made a specific cabinet for Quake. Yes. So uh, the Quake came out as an arcade game. Uh, the arcade version was released in 1998 on a custom Quicksilver PC with a 266 megahertz Pentium 2 processor and 32 megabytes of RAM. The computer itself would have been squeezed into just your standard arcade cabinet with the controls being a trackball of all things and, and a series of arcade buttons. So this was sold as both a kit and a standalone system. The standalone system uh, being produced in limited quantities the marquee for the game had the title of the game quake and uh most images of the cabinet show it was in a black housing even the official like versions of it that were released were in either a kind of a generic housing or just a black housing with the um the company that was distributing the stand the the standalone system that wasn't the kit so the cabinet again had a very small run and in total had probably only about maybe 150,000 units that's how many that have been currently tracked down it's currently one of the rarest arcade cabinets available and as mentioned the game was sold as a conversion kit but it was considered too expensive for most arcades to just purchase because you were buying an entire computer (laughs) like you weren't buying a board you weren't buying a board that you had to hook up to like a crt you were buying a legitimate windows i think it was windows 95 uh computer and built into a quicksilver so um conversion kits like the non-conversion kit versions are equally rare um so you 
if you do find one, you're you're in for some nice money. Uh, in Quake Arcade Tournament Edition, you play Quake, uh, the id classic first person shooter that originally came out in 1996. Uh, and for those who don't know, and we'll probably talk about Quake in an upcoming episode, uh, Quake is very similar to Doom. It is a first person shooter where you kill bunch of monsters um, but there is more emphasis in the storyline of quake on the horror elements uh, with the whole game having kind of a lovecraftian theme and kind of taking itself a little bit more seriously than i think doom tends to take itself uh in the arcade version there are some differences the enemies have been slightly modified they drop backpacks that can uh, earn the player in-game coins so you can spawn in extra lives and such and you could also win prize redemption tickets through an optional printer that was available for some of the kits Perfect. so uh yeah you could earn a bunch of points and then print out your tickets and go like you know redeem redeem a couple of uh get a teddy chocolate. bear or something so yeah uh, a, a, just a bizarre arcade cabinet. I didn't really know when else we would get the chance to really talk about it. I figured it was appropriate because it's it is Quake can be a spooky game, a little horror-y. Yeah, it is. It is horror, horror-y. So, horror-y. Horror, horror-y. So I thought it was fitting. But just bizarre thing to exist. It's like one of those things where you're like, really? <laughs> okay. So yeah, so that's our um, horror arcade cabinets episode. Uh, Hopefully you learned as much as we did. We we learned we learned we learned a lot in this episode, I think, about how arcade cabinets can have very silly artwork on them or have weird controllers like a mouse and a wee nunchuck. <laughs> or like the keyboard for um uh, what is it? The typing, typing of, the of the dead? Yes, yes, yes very good. Yeah. So now we'll we'll talk about games that we're excited about uh, buying, waiting, or passing on that are not for the arcade. Yes, that's right. Zach, you can go first. All right. Well, so Seth, the game that I put out of my buy, wait, pass is called Honey, I Joined a Cult. Uh, and Honey, I Joined a Cult is supposedly coming out soon-ish, according to Steam. So their, their, their release date says coming soon-ish. So who knows? The game is being developed by Soul Survivor Games, published by Team 17 Digital, and it is a base building game where you create, customize, and expand a 1970s cult. Um, and it looks very, very fun. I really like the art style. It reminds me of uh, Prison Architect, which I think Seth was uh, saying um, it, before we started the podcast, we were talking about it. And, and I'm looking for more strategy games to play. So this kind of looks like it's up my alley. So it's probably going to be a buy for me. Yeah, I think I, am, I might pick it up too. I like Prison Architect. It's a, it's a fun fun game and this looks like it's like prison architect except with a cult which is also fun yes like the game that i'm excited about is a game called after party it's uh to being developed by night school studio and uh, will be out on the well and is out and was recently out it came out on october 22nd oh, uh cool the night night school studio is the same company that a uh, night school studio is the same company that made oxen free which is a fun game that uses a unique dialogue system in order to progress through the story in the game you play as milo and lola who are recently dead and have to spend an eternity in hell unless they out drink satan nice uh, it's a game that uses the intelligent conversation system that Oxenfree has and expands on that as it is a sequel. So it's been more developed. And this conversation system changes the story and relationships as you pick dialogue options and as you stumble through the underworld on this bender. Um, I really enjoyed Oxenfree as a game. Uh, I thought it was very quirky and fun. And After Party is probably going to be equally quirky and equally fun. I think that the premise is interesting and uh, frankly just kind of funny trying to outdrink Satan at a bar. And there are like multiple libations that you can imbibe that will change the that dialogue and change mm. things as things go on you could play like beer pong with satan and stuff like that sounds like it's gonna be a blast though however i'm gonna wait on it just when the mood strikes me my fancy will i uh think about picking up uh after party uh i don't think it's gonna be immediate buy for me especially i guess it's already out i don't own it but um but but when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie that's when you're gonna buy it and that's amore <laughs> i guess <laughs> so that's it that's our that's our complete episode of 
horror arcade games. Uh, and that ends our, our three-part spooky season of Classic Gaming Brothers, where we talked about some spooky games and some just strange games mostly spooky sometimes classy it's mostly spooky <sighs> sometime that doesn't even work the spooky gaming brothers the spooky <laughs> gaming brothers uh so zach do you want to let everybody know how to uh support us listen to us and contact us <laughs> yes absolutely so seth if you want to support us listen to us and contact us there's plenty... i don't want to do it i i don't Our no i'm talking do well i'm t- doing a rhetorical right now you know it's just like i'm asking all right if our listeners want to uh contact no i'm going all confused if our listeners want to listen to us support us contact us probably that's the order I don't even know anymore. Anyway, (laughs) if you want to support us, there's plenty of ways to support us. The first thing you can do is you can tell three friends. Or you can tell as many friends as you want. Just tell people that you listened to Classic Gaming Brothers and you loved it. Or tell people you didn't love it, but maybe that'll put them on the right track to listen to it. I hope you like it, because you've listened to most of the episodes so far, and you're at the end of the episode. So that means you at least listen to it. Anyway... Uh, other ways to support us is just sharing, you know, on Facebook and stuff, uh, liking all of our different social medias. We are available on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram, it's Classic Gaming Brothers. Twitter, it's CG Brothers Pod. Um, so be sure to like us and follow us on all those, ring bells, do all those things in order to also. Oh, also, if you want to support us, you can buy our merch. You obviously don't have to, but if you want to have a t-shirt that has Seth and My Face on it, we have a t-shirt that's available on our website. So feel free to purchase that with your money. Um, You don't have to, again. Um, Don't feel like you have to. Uh, We do this for fun, uh, and we do it for free. So the other thing that you can do if you want to um, support us is listen to us, which you're doing right now. But if you want to tell people how to listen to us, let them know that they can find us on any available podcasting application out there. We are available on all the podcasting applications that we are aware of. Um, there might be some out there that are secret and we don't know about. And if they are out there and are secret, then you best let us know because we will get on those podcast applications. We, they will no longer be secret. Uh, yeah, so we're available on any of the podcasting applications out there. Um, you know, it's it's great. You can listen to us. We much very much appreciate it. We're also available on YouTube. Um, we have pretty much all of our episodes at this point uploaded onto youtube we are available on twitch can't listen to us on twitch but you can certainly watch us on twitch twitch is uh, twitch.tv forward slash classic gaming brothers you can check out my view when my internet's behaving which is twitch.tv forward slash vs classic gaming brothers you might see us hanging out in the, the twitch chat every now and then i'm just kind of chatting around so feel free to hit us up there what else? Oh, finally, yeah. If you want to, if you want to contact us, that's a great way to support us as well. If you want to contact us, you can go through your favorite email client and email classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com or classicgamingbrothers at classicgamingbrothers.com or Zach at classicgamingbrothers.com or Seth at classicgamingbrothers.com because they all go to the exact same inbox which is our gmail account um so feel free to send us an email we would love to read your uh, your you know um we would love to read any critiques or any uh you know support that you have for the podcast any ideas that you have for the podcast we've done episodes based on ideas so um you know definitely give us a listen to if you if you want to uh uh if you if you Definitely send us an email if you want to support us. You can also go to our website, ClassicGamingBrothers.com. You can send us a uh, message through our contact form. It just goes right to our email, so we'll reach out to you then. Um, contact us through different social medias, which I previously mentioned. I'll say them again. It's our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Facebook and Instagram, Classic Gaming Brothers Twitter, CG Brothers Pod. If you send us an email, guess what? You will be automatically entered into a chance to win one free video game off of a list that seth has of free video games that he has and is wanting to give away because the list is only getting bigger um and that list is not getting smaller so seth needs to get rid of those games fast otherwise he will have a very long list and no one to give games to so make sure to reach out to us and and let us know that you want a free game um but also please provide us yeah please give us feedback don't just say I want a free game. Well, I if mean, you, you can. I mean, yeah, we probably will have someone do that and we'll probably give them a free game. <laughs> but anyway, so that's uh, all the ways that you can uh, support us. 
listen to us and contact us, which is a different order than we usually do it in. So it did kind of throw me off. But um, Seth is back from whatever trip that he took. But he got up and just walked away. Uh, so Seth, maybe you can help me out and you can help me decide what that last thing that I couldn't remember is. There's one thing I just I keep. It's on the tip of my tongue. I just can't figure it out. What is it? Don't play games like my brother. Uh, yes. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Zach. I've been Seth. And we've been the classic gaming brothers. That's right. That's right.